Yeah. Thank Thank you you very much. Welcome, Dwight. (laughs) Hi, everyone. Looking forward to this. Uh, Let's just dive right in. Would you mind just introducing yourself and and what you're about to play? I already know, but... Um, My name is Jeannie. I'm a senior, um, and I would like to play the Mozart concerto, um, First Movement and Cadenza. Fabulous. Bravo. It sounds wonderful. You're, you're evoking a lot of different characters. The, the, one of the big things, and not to get technical right away, but um, I, I, I'm concerned with your tempo stability. There are a number of times when, when you take a breath or when you get expressive through a passage, including some 16th notes uh, like this. That section, you slowed down quite a lot. And we're going to have an issue with the rhythm going on in the strings through that. Tricky to do, right? Playing by ourselves to keep that subdivision going. Keep your tempo consistent, right? Well, all those musical ideas, put them into, into place in just rock solid tempo and, and rhythm. I, I find it really helpful just to imagine the, the orchestra part going along as you play. Let's hear it. I really think you should use the full fingering. I use the middle finger in my right hand as well to keep the pitch of the D natural low enough. It'll, it'll fly away on you if you're not careful. And make it an expressive note, even, even though it's fast. I mean, the first note of the slurred pair tends to get a little bit short changed sometime. I think you have an opportunity that we're missing a little bit to bring out some different characters right here at the beginning. But let, let's remember that Mozart was an operatic composer First and foremost, I mean, that was his great passion. And at any time we're playing a, a solo piece, I mean, frankly, anything in Mozart, I just think of opera and the different characters that are involved. And as a soloist, you can bring out those different voices. What if you brought out this first thing, like one character, and then from the C natural, the slurred passage, do something different, maybe less, it could be actually more. Uh, on some level, it doesn't really matter. What matters is that you really bring it forth and convince us. In vocal pedagogy, this is just a head shake. It's a form of ornamentation. It's called a head shake because literally a singer shakes their head to make it happen. It's just a little flourish. No extra preparation or length on the trill. Just go. Like a, like a bird in a bird bath. <sighs> I do think you need to be consistent. So come up with an interpretation that spans the entire piece. Let's, let's not have some of them one way and some of them another way, or high notes shorter than low notes, or, or anything like that. And that's about consistency and homogeneity with the way we're approaching our instrument and our interpretation of the piece. Maybe you can spend like two minutes just to go get down some Let's hear it. Well, bravo. It's a great cadenza. I, I, think I, it, I think I've heard it before, or at least something very much like it in your recording. It's similar, yeah. Okay. It, it, especially you're, you're, you know, you're standing next to the person who wrote it, whom we all respect greatly. But right now it's your thing. Tr- play it like your cadenza, not imitative of, of the way he played it or you know, of anything else. Um, it, sa- it sounded a little conservative to me. For right now, I want to encourage you to commit to a new interpretation. No time at the beginning, just go, impetuous.
course. Thank you very much. <laughs> Wonderful plan. Forever. Okay, hi. Hello, Gary. Uh, my name is Daniel Gurevich. I'll be playing Syrinx by Debussy. Beautiful playing. Um, are you familiar with uh, the genesis of this piece? Oh, so it was it was written as incidental music to a, to a to a play, yeah, called the Flute of Pan, and it was to be performed off stage at a key moment in the play, and so very very distant, very otherworldly, very free. And it just evokes a little bit something of what this is. It's not really meant as a showpiece. It's incidental music. So imagine someone's going with playing. You know, like talking, giving a speech while you're doing this. Um, uh, the main thing that's getting me from the beginning and that you did consistently is kind of a diminuendo in held notes and then kind of pushing the moving notes. And to, to my ear, I prefer this to sound more fluid than that. Kind of like a waterfall. The water doesn't go straight down. It goes out, then it goes down. There's some momentum forward. That's like your long notes, the flowing stream, and the, the, the other notes are like the waterfall. Then you're less. Yeah. yeah this, is, this is really common in Debussy's writing, though. The, the crescendo followed by piano. It means subito piano. It's, it's not that you don't have the freedom to take time. But don't make diminuendo prior to a subito piano. And we should, we should know that about, about Debussy. That it happens all the time. It's, over, it's all over La Mer and, and other stuff. For me, the next section that says rubato was on the slow side in general, and I didn't feel like you were giving us any inertia. Mm -hmm. Rubato is both, right? It's not just like menomoso. Like you can, you can move through some things. What if you rush through the crescendo a little bit? Da -da -di -um. And then with no pause, no breath there. That's the climax. I mean, that's the climax of the whole thing. Uh, I, I like to lightly articulate grace notes, even when they appear under slurs. Almost all the time I do that. I think they should really sparkle like stage jewelry. Just come out special. Stand out from the texture if you have a, a, a you know, something looking kind of two-dimensional, then those grace notes are special in some way and should come out of the texture. But extrapolating from that stage jewelry, stage makeup, the concept is essentially that we need to um, portray what we're doing on a slightly larger scale as though we're farther away. The articulation, the grace notes, everything, play with subtlety for the back of the audience. Do you know what the word pivdendosi means? So we shouldn't really know where the note ends. And make a diminuendo down to nothing. The secret of making that diminuendo is keeping your support in place so you're blowing fortissimo, I mean really blowing, and just sealing it off, a combination of your embouchure aperture closing around it and the back of your tongue lifting, lifting up so you have a more focused stream of air. And then you can get all the way down to nothing, maybe even with a good read on a good day, a low D flat. Bravo! Thank you so much. I'll be playing the solo from the second movement of Scheherazade. Great.
Okay, nice job. Yeah, it's a, it's a great moment. Uh, something that you did really well was you brought out you brought out a lot of these details that I'm that I'm looking at here, including the accents on the eighth notes um, in the second you know second part of the phrase, the reiteration of that first one. Accent in this context, in a vocal context, isn't really about hitting the reed with your tongue. It's about expression within the note. But it, it's an appropriate time to bring up the point that whether you're playing. Uh, you know, Mozart or, or Rimsky Korsakov said all in Italian, or you're playing Mahler, and even a native German speaker might not understand it, it's really worth looking up every single word in the whole score for the simple reason that the composer wrote it. It's as important as the notes themselves. And uh, sometimes it drastically changes our interpretation when we really understand what they're saying. Yeah, that's, that's, I liked it a lot. And as, as I said, there are many interpretations of this and one is not better or right or wrong. I do really like it when they're distinct though. And similar to what we were doing with the Mozart earlier, like if you, if you kind of make diminuendo before you're going to do a color change, then the color's already changed. And so when, when you want to bring something distinctive, hang on to it, commit to that part of the character, then, then make a change. Um, study with, with Mac, and John Mac made a point to talk about the Russian triplets in this piece. So I think he mentions it on his CD as well, because he's talking about how normal triplets, and then there's Russian triplets, because the, it's the, the whole thing is very tripletized. And the, the most meaningful part of a triplet is sort of not at the beginning, but it's sort of in the middle of it. And, and it's sort of rhythmically disorganized, as, as our culture tends to be. So... <laughs> No, you know, Mr. Isatov, I don't think I'm qualified in present company. That's <laughs> the Russian triplet. <laughs> um, although I would take it a step further, and it's not just Russian music in which we should evoke the middle notes within a triplet and be expressive throughout the entire rhythm. Yeah? Uh, you, you catch my point about continuing to sing through these changes. That, that difference in what you're playing now, I'm really appreciating. It doesn't sound like you're making a point of like bringing in the orchestra, but you're just continuing to sing, and it happens to be rhythmically accurate with a little swing into the downbeat. <laughs> Bravo. Okay. Um, while well, well, the next person's getting ready, I, I want to make uh, a point about orchestral excerpts. There are a lot of options with etude books, or rather excerpt books, and IMSL, I highly, highly advise you all to get the entire complete original part, or I mean, it can be a copy, but the whole part and not off of IMSLP either. There are so many mistakes. Most of them are just some guy who's inputted the notes and they're often wrong. Yeah. So um, now when you're in school is a great time to start building your library. Anytime you come across this music, whether it's a colleague or a teacher, or you happen to play it in the orchestra, make a photocopy and have it organized. If you start that process now, it'll, it'll uh, build sanity into your lives. <laughs> okay, hi, I'm gonna uh, play some excerpts from Bartok's Concerto for Orchestra. Your name? Colton Potter. Colton, hi Colton. So Bartok, all right. Nice job. Yeah, some good character going on. In general, the quality of your staccato articulation is right on the money. Um, it needs to be extreme or it wouldn't be funny. And um, the, the, it, we sort of see in the tempo marking as well as in the character that's obvious to us. Allegretto scherzando. Do you know what scherzando means? Well, yeah, like very, very joking. 
Jokingly, playfully, yes, absolutely. Scherzo in Italian means a joke, and so it, we should be kind of extreme with this stuff. And that goes for our dynamics as well. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's great. I, I like to hear that rhythmic play. Uh, okay, okay. I think you're playing a little too long. Although if, if, you, if you are wedded to the interpretation of the duples being super long, you'd have to really convince me by relaxing the dynamic of the second one so that it's a little more pathetic. Tio, 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 tio. Then, then I, could, I could agree with you. Right now it just sounds kind of smooth. But uh, yeah, any of those interpretations will work. It just, if it's kind of too smooth, we lose character. You're, uh, I'd like you to evoke the staccato that's deliberately written on the 16th note at the end of the slur in 33 and 34. It should be implied anyway, but he actually wrote it. So really clip that note. Let's move on to another excerpt. Aha! We have these intervals on our instrument, and they will just bite us in the ankle if we're not careful. Um, you know, you know what I mean. And they're obvious to us. We know exactly what the intervals are, um, but let's not make it obvious to the audience what they are. That little bit of extra attention you paid to a problematic cross fingering made it sound really smooth to where I was sitting, and pretty different from the blip that you played a moment before. Right. Right. So, so you're capable. We are all capable of this. It takes quite a bit of, it's never second nature. It never just happens. You don't get to be so great that when you play a B natural to B flat, it's smooth every time. Every single time I play that interval, I have an extra bit of attention and I make sure it's as smooth as possible. Every single time. Okay. So that's, that's part of, part of what we do. Attending to all those little things. Right. Oh. Andrew, I'll be playing the uh, third movement of the Mozart Oboe Quartet. Great. Hey, nice job. Beautiful playing. I almost thought you were going to go for the last three notes because you made that crescendo and the repeat, which actually would not be contrary to Mozart's writing. He didn't write piano at the end. We just sort of traditionally do it uh, and it works. But um, but you could you could equally make an argument that it should <laughs> have a big thing at the end. Um, I've got this this awesome pocket score. I don't know if you can still find him. It's an Eulenberg. And it's right out of the microfilm. And you can actually find the microfilm online too. You can, you can see it in Mozart's hand. It's pretty cool. Yeah. Anyway, but, but it's worth taking a look. It'll, it'll be informative for you. Um, and then you'll know what choices you're making, that they're your choices, not what some editor has put into it, um, not contrary to what Mozart has written, but maybe elaborating upon it, shaping the phrase beyond what Mozart wrote, as he himself would have done. Um, Mozart was improvising his way through his piano and violin concerti. He would improvise cadenzas, uh, and it was not uncommon for performers of the time to actually improvise and um, ornament, you know, a classical concerto. I'm not opposed to it at all. I, frankly, I, I wish we would do more of it. Right. So. Put, put enough enough space and distinction on the repeated A natural that we really hear it. Then the next eighth note is short when it's tongued. Then you're doing your long thing. I don't think this way when I'm playing. I'm not thinking about all these like tiny little things. I'm thinking of a consistent character. But I often practice with like tiny little things to lock them into my brain and, and make sure I don't fall into some bad habits of playing a dull note or not inflecting upwards when I'm trying to carry the phrase over a rest or a break or mixed rhythm. 
and, and then you can let go a little bit. No technique, no facility, meaning I don't want to hear it. But the point I'm trying to make is actually just presenting a consistent character within the phrase. Nice to hear you. Bravo. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, let's just keep it to five, ten minutes-ish. And I just want to say, uh, I was thinking of the first time I really heard you outside of New World. Um, this was when you played Mala One when you were in Philharmonic. Because years later, I saw an interview with you or read about it. I think it was a video. Um, and I think somebody asked you, you know, a bunch of regular questions. And somebody asked you if you get nervous when you perform. And you mentioned that you, you try to find a friendly face in the audience. So one thing I've noticed in my own playing is oftentimes I feel pretty good in the practice room when I'm working on small chunks. And then when I go out to perform or in a high pressure situation, it's, it's not nearly as convincing as maybe I got it in the five minutes in the practice room. Yeah, uh, boy, that's a, that's a large topic. There's a lot of psychology about this. Um, I think maybe one, one way I can answer this is that we should not underestimate the impact that stress has on your cognition and your attention. When we become nervous, we don't think as clearly. We don't perform at our peak with, with almost anything. And if you can find a way to channel that energy, be more giving of what you have, let the excitement carry you, but not fall into yourself, become inward, feel, uh, feel judged, maybe, maybe judging yourself, get overly concerned with some hypothetical outcome of how well you play and someone hears you and maybe hires you, you just cannot think about that stuff. So clear the table of all of that junk and all you've got is your oboe and the music you're gonna play in that exact moment. It's not, it's not any more complicated than just clearing your mind, focusing on your breath for a moment, looking for that friendly face and giving them a personal performance. Yeah, you're, you're a human being, uh, we all are and um, in, in spite of Mr. Isotov's story, uh, I, I have experienced nervousness. And I, I, in all humility and honesty, part of the reason, I think a big part, that I did really well in New York all those years ago is because I was just a kid and I had no idea what I was doing. And I didn't know what I didn't know. And I just went in and played. I just didn't even think about it until it was all over. If you can get into that kind of like a, a childlike, just an enjoyment and appreciation for where you are, then you'll bring your best playing. You don't have to think about it so much. And you'll be amazed what happens when you're really just being yourself out there. There's, there's a really clear and a big difference between making a mistake and playing in a manner that is not consistently excellent. You know, uh, You've got to have all the fundamentals in place. It's generally very well in tune, very well in time, with great character and precision and rhythm. And then your low D doesn't speak. I tell you, I don't cut people from an audition when a note doesn't speak. Neither do I. I don't even cut from people from an audition if one is if, if there's a wrong note. But when it sounds like there's a systemic issue, like a person isn't really that well prepared, or they, they don't have the sound to, to support what we're trying to do in the orchestra, or their pitch is bad, like this one out of two note, no big deal. Um, in fact, I almost look for the mistake because everybody makes them and see how you recover from it. Some people fall apart and the rest of the audition is just crap. And other people make a little mistake. It's like tripping on the sidewalk. You know, some people fall down, other people do a little dance and oh, and you keep on walking. You, you just, just roll with it, you know? Whatever just happened is in the past. It no longer exists. Don't even think about it. Always, now, and a little forward. Uh, Dwight, thank you so much. I, you know, uh, we so wish this would be in person. This hopefully will be in person. Hopefully you liked us, so you'll come back. I'd love to see you again. I'm so appreciative of, of all of you who played today. Um, some brilliant, beautiful, beautiful playing. Thank you so much. And thanks for inviting me.